Hi everybody, it's me, the Fetch, host of Inside the Eye Live. Before the Sunday mainstream media political pundit talk shows, there is Inside the Eye Live, where we break down some of the weekly mainstream media talking points before the talking points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, The Fetch, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. on freedomslips.com don't forget freedomslips.com and right now I want to do a little tech thing with uh, Ahmad I'm going to plug in the speaker for the headset because I have guests here so Ahmad are you there yes ma'am yes ma'am okay I'm going to plug this in tell me if you can hear me can you hear me yes ma'am it worked. Yay. Thank you. And it stopped some of the background noise. <laughs> yeah, it's because we were just open mic here. And so we are going to have people come again. We're in uh, San Pedro, California. We just finished the uh, Sky Fire 41st anniversary conference, mini conference. And we were, uh, inter- well, we were showing Travis Walton's movie. And Travis Walton and Jennifer Stein were here. And, oh, got to plug something in. Hold on <laughs> for our guest. Uh, whoops. Okay, here. Hold on. Nope, you just pulled it off my head here. Let me figure this out. One second. Got to plug in. All right, can you hear me? I had to replug. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great, great. So, we have our very special guest, Travis Walton. We're going to be joined later by Jen Stein, Jennifer Stein, and probably some other people. But uh, welcome to our show, Travis. You're not going to be able to hear me through this because this is not a mixer board, but we'll have to just talk well, to each good other. To be with you. Okay, great. So I don't know how many people out there know about Travis Walton. He was probably uh, the first major abductee, contactee, experiencer on the planet besides Betty and Barney, not Betty and, yeah, Barney Hill, yeah, they were in the 60s, and Travis had an experience 41 years ago to the day yesterday, so Travis, would you like to tell our listeners a little bit about, you know, like, I'm sure a lot of people have heard the story, but as much as you want to say about your initial experience in, what was it, 1960? 1975, Five. Uh, yeah, uh, and it's uh, recounted in the movie Fire in the Sky, and in uh, a couple of dozen uh, television programs over the years, in the last 41 years, but you know, there was a, uh, I was working with a group of six other men in the woods, and uh, we encountered a UFO uh, in the forest on our way home from work, and uh, I went up to get a closer look and was taken aboard. Right, and that was an amazing experience, which they duplicated in the fire in the sky. And recently, there was a new documentary movie, which has won tons of awards, called Travis. And people get stuck in, on that uh, sequence because fire in the sky depicted one thing, and then there's the reality of what happened. Yeah, the you know Hollywood always uh, has quite a big uh, degree of fictionalization with. Uh, 
movies made from real life events. It's it's you know comes with the territory, but. Uh, and many, uh, many people think that they went a little bit too far with uh, Fire in the Sky in the fictionalization. So that's what we're here to do is set the record straight about what really happened. Right. So can you slow that down as much as you can remember um, what happened on board ship? What's your first recollection? So well, you're on board this ship and then... Well, you know, I got too close. I was I hit by a blast of energy from the craft. What I what I think was an accidental discharge, uh, and uh, uh, when I woke up, I was on board the craft, and uh, I was in a great deal of pain and feeling extremely wounded. And uh, it's it's probably uh, after many years of analyzing what happened, uh, not what I thought at first, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, encountering these beings and uh, feeling in a very claustrophobic environment uh, with uh, the feeling of suffocation that just uh, sent my uh, panic levels, you know, off the chart. So, I, I wanted to go into, you said you felt very wounded. Where in your body did you experience pain? Was it? A localized thing, general? Uh, it was uh, primarily in the head and chest area, but also generalized throughout. You know, just sort of uh, uh, lesser and lesser the part you got from the area where uh, I was struck by the energy from this craft. And you, you recollect, or you recall that it, where did it hit you, the energy being part of your body? Well, uh, in the head and chest area, that's the part of me that um, was closest to the craft and uh, I think allowed the energy to jump to ground by way of me. And so there was a, a tremendous amount of damage done to the point where it was so violent and throwing me back through the air, you know, 15 or 20 feet, that the crew was immediately certain that I was dead. So, uh, you know, one crewman described it as uh, me fa uh, falling to the ground like a sack of meat, you know, without a bone in my body, uh, because the power of that blast, they, they compared it to, you know, stepping on a landmine or, uh, you know, a grenade or something. Mm -hmm. So, were you kind of like, uh, when you said that before, were you like a lightning rod for the energy that was exactly, discharging? Exactly, yeah, you know, and uh, just by getting too close underneath this crap, it was hovering, uh, you know, low to the ground. Uh, it uh, a discharge injured me, and probably you know one possibility is that they never had an, any intention of taking me aboard. But uh, once I was uh, basically killed, uh, uh, they were forced to take me aboard in order to uh, revive me. Uh, the nearest hospital being you know over an hour away, and none of the crew knowing anything about CPR, and you know probably the damage was much more extensive than anybody could have. On, on Earth could handle it anyway. Right. So they, let's just explore the accident hypothesis. So they accidentally uh, wounded you. They, they may have killed you or you would have died and they brought you on board. So when you woke up, did you have any sense of time passing or? No, I didn't know where I was. I was very disoriented and uh, just sort of, I, I didn't like immediately like waking up. It was coming to a very gradual sort of way where I was in and out for an extended period of time. And then when I was finally aware of my surroundings to some degree, thought that I might be in a hospital. Mm -hmm. It was only when I was finally able to focus my eyes, I could see that these weren't doctors standing over me and just, you know, just really basically flipped out. Uh, it was, so, so when you saw there were were there one or two or three beings? Uh, there was three of them standing over me, and uh, I just immediately tried to push them away from me and and get away from them. And they had this device across my chest. Uh, I at first, you know, associated it with the pain, but uh, I'm thinking now it, it was either some sort of treatment or diagnostic equipment. Uh, when it fell off, I could see that it was lighted uh, from the upper side. So uh, that makes me think that it might have been some kind of a, 
a viewing thing, but you know, it's, it could have been both, you know, some sort of treatment or whatever. Right. But I was mainly just focused on them and uh, seeing them, you know, because of the you know, strangeness of their parents, I associated uh, my feeling wounded with them and, uh, you know, took uh, the, the, just their approach is extremely menacing, which it probably wasn't, but, uh, you know, I certainly took it that way. I backed away and I found an object that they had there that I you know, flailed through the air to keep them from coming any closer. And, okay, um, so you found, let, let, me, let me back up to the beings and then we'll go to the object. So the, the beings, we've seen all these depictions of aliens now, all gray aliens, and so were they, were they in the gray range, were they humanoid? Well, you know, they didn't have the term grays back then, but right. uh, they would probably be closest to the, to the type of being that is described by the word grays, although I would say it was more white, grayish white than right. whitish gray, you know what I mean? But um, uh -huh. I think that because there's, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's possible that some of these civilizations out there have been spacefaring for a very long time, mm -hmm. that they could have actually spread out to planets and become slightly differentiated with a uh, you know, from a basis, base stock that um, uh, may have, you know, been thousands of years before. So you could have very similar beings that, <clears throat> um, you know, people on Earth and seeing various kinds might all lump into one category when they're really from a different place. Right. Yeah. So the, their their environment and the conditions of the planets that they live on change them physically. Um, do you recall how tall they might have been? They were really short. They were well under four feet. And uh, um, the size of the eye is something I had a lot of time to think about. I was focused on the eyes because once I started flailing at them uh, to start uh, stop their approach, there was a stare involved that I found extremely uncomfortable. And so I'm thinking that that was an attempt at some sort of uh, telepathic control. Oh, okay, yeah. And, and, and I think the reason it was so uncomfortable was because I, at that point, uh, was having some kind of neurological disturbance or damage from being hit by that being. And, and this, this telepathic control thing was not working. Right. So when they, uh, so I'm an experiencer contacting. So when they communicate with you telepathically, it's like you feel a buzz in the third eye. Did you have any? It was the squirmy feeling in my head that was very. It was it felt invasive. I think the the three of them staring at me was the, them combining forces uh, um, to try to overcome me, and you know. It wasn't just to subdue me uh, for my own uh, good, I mean, you know, as a defense against me attacking them, but also because it was important at that point, I think, for them to resume whatever uh, resuscitation that had been ongoing when I unexpectedly regained consciousness. So, so that, that's I wondered about, because if you were thrown 15 to 20 feet, you probably had some broken bones. Have you ever had any um, x-rays on? I had body? upper body x-rays that uh, showed no damage of any kind. And, uh, you know, I have uh, no reason to think there was any damage after I was returned. Whatever sort of repairs might have been made were so extensive, that, you know, it was um, undetectable. Um, it's way and, beyond our technology. Yeah, and, you know, there was quite a bit of evidence that there was high levels of radiation in that clearing that affected the growth of the trees, and uh, I think one of the other crewmen who developed um, skin cancer on uh, the exposed part of his body. So um, there was probably quite a bit of that sort of damage and perhaps why it took five days to complete the repairs. Completely return. And uh, so let's go back to, so you were uh, being uh, 
communicated with and it was felt squirmy and squirmy and so then you broke away what happened when you broke away you said you grabbed some piece of equipment yeah i just flailed at him and i was planning an attack to get past them because the only way out of that room was on the other side of them but they abruptly turned and left and once they i think figured out that they weren't going to be able to uh, get me under control it was in their uh, immediate safety and my own best interest to somehow get someone that could uh, uh, control me. Do you have any recollection of what you what was the what you were lying upon? Was it a bed with a cushion? Was it metallic? It, there was no cushion. It was just a table. Is it? Uh, and uh, a hard surface. Hard surface, so you don't really know what it was. I guess it was leading. I said metallic, but it, it had a metallic look, but you know, it could have been plastic or or, been plastic. or ceramic or something. I don't know. Maybe some material we couldn't possibly know. What did the room look like? The first room. Uh, it was uh, angular, like a, a triangular, and uh, trapezoidal, basically. Uh -huh. You know, uh, two equal walls that uh, angled out from each other and then along and short on either end of those. So basically kind of like a, a piece of pie with the tip a bit off. So it was uh, inside of this craft, very cramped, very dimly lit, claustrophobic, and again this feeling of suffocation. Wow. So I was desperate to find a way out of there as quickly as I could. So the air, so when you're feeling suffocated, maybe the air was different? Yeah, it may not, you know, it, it, it could have been uh, uh, due to some injury to my lungs or even my nervous system that was making breathing difficult, but also quite likely that it was some problem with the atmosphere in there. The reason I say that is because when this other type of being came in to remove me from there, that person was wearing a helmet. Oh. And so I think perhaps to, you know, provide uh, a, a better atmosphere uh, for them. And this was a human looking individual that I first uh, mistakenly took to be somebody from Earth there to rescue me from these creatures. So uh, I do, we're going to go back to the, the piece of equipment that you. Grab, but let's go to the, the human, humanoid-looking, human-looking person. Do you know what they were? They wearing something? Were they nude? Or? Uh, the these first, I don't know what you described as grays, uh, they were wearing a, a an orange-brown sort of coverall, loosely fitting. Um, and uh, this human-looking individual wore a more closely fitting uh, blue uniform. I didn't notice any sorts of um, insignia or name tags or anything like that, you know. Nothing to indicate where they were from, but it, um, um, I just assumed at first that it was somebody to rescue me because I was, you know, uppermost in my mind to get away from these, these creatures. So the, the three small beings were just identical? Yeah, yeah. Did they look identical? Yeah, you know, there may have been difference amongst them that I wasn't able to detect, but mm -hmm. because they were hairless and very similar in size, you know, I, I couldn't detect uh, differences among them. You know, people say, were they clones? Well, I don't know, you know, they look very similar, but, you know, if you looked at a herd of cattle, you'd probably think they all looked alike. Right. Uh, uh, humans are actually kind of unique in having uh, easily distinguishable appearance. You can see from 100 yards away. Uh, most animals on the earth, uh, you'd, uh, you'd have trouble identifying differences among them. It'd be very easy to find a whole row that looked identical, which might be quite distantly related. Uh -huh. So this humans-looking species, how it was it male or female? How tall? Well, the uh, first individual was um, male, and he took me to a room where there were some other people dressed like him, same uniform, blue tight fitting, uh, 
black shoes, footwear of some kind, and uh, black belt. Uh, and uh, one of the others was a female. And this, you know, like they, they were, you know, looking quite human. Mm -hmm. uh, but they weren't responding to my questions. And I was extremely anxious about what my situation was and was, you know, pleading for some kind of response about where I was being taken, what was happening to me, you know, this whole thing. And the, the longer it went without getting any response, the more suspicious I became that this was not a rescue. Not a rescue. So let's go back to so the, the three, what I'm calling gray, but that's not accurate, they're more like white little short beans. Uh, you, they left and you grabbed some piece of equipment. What was what the what was that like? Well, there was a whole array of things, you know. And I, you know, I kind of had an interest in medical matters over the years. I I became an EMT, but um, that these instruments really don't resemble anything that I would consider familiar medical equipment. But uh, there was a whole array of the things that could have been something along those lines because they were very shiny, like polished metal. And uh, uh, a variety of shapes, you know, twisted. Uh, uh, I, I really was not studying them. I just uh -huh. glanced real quick grabbed and grabbed one. the biggest thing that I thought might present a threat to them. And that was some sort of a clear cylinder along with tube or rod uh, that I flailed at through the air. I, now, they weren't close enough to strike at that point, and they didn't move within range. I was just trying to keep them from getting any closer. They extended their hands towards me, which, you know, actually could have been some sort of pacifying gesture. Uh, I doubt it had anything to do with their attempt at telepathic control. But for whatever reason, at that point, it seemed more threatening that they were reaching towards me. Uh, even though they were smaller than me, I was outnumbered and felt extremely weak. So I felt vulnerable because I, mm. I felt the need to fight or or flee and, and was finding movement uh, very difficult. So so you got away from them. Let's go back in sequence. And they moved away. Then where did you go? Um, I went looking for a way out, you know, just a door, a door. Uh, I actually went right past one door because in my panic, I was going down this tight passageway that curved so tightly I couldn't see if I was being pursued because anything within just a few feet behind me would be around the curve. Same thing ahead of me, so I was kind of torn whether I was running from them that I at first thought might be behind me or what am I running into, so it's an even worse situation. But uh, I came to another door and saw uh, into a round room with some doorways opposite that, in my confusion, thought might lead to the outside. Once I pieced together the layout of the craft later, I could see that those doorways would not have led to the outside. But that was my thinking at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, had I found an outside door, it might have been extremely dangerous to get it open. <laughs> If, if it had, the craft had been in space or, or at, at very extremely high altitude um, at that point in time. But were you, uh, what was your emotional state when you were doing this? This surfing? whole thing was just a mindless panic. You know, my mind just a torrent of, uh, of you know, thoughts about escape and, uh, and not really uh, clear thinking. It was. I did things that weren't exactly the smartest thing to do under that circumstance. And thinking that I could just open a door and drop to the ground, assuming that this craft was still in the woods, was probably not the case. Mm -hmm. But that's what I was, uh, my, my uh, mission, my single-minded efforts were at that time. And uh, the doorways uh, inside this room, I, I in, investigated them first. and. I was unable to find any way of opening them. There wasn't a doorknob or a button or anything there. So um, I went looking for controls and then discovered that when I moved um, 
deeper into the room, more closer to the center of the room, uh, that it would spontaneously darken. And it was kind of alarming at first. I thought, you know, that there might be uh, some being you know, responsible for the change, uh, kind of alarmed by the change in the in the surroundings. But I figured out that it had something to do with my position, that it was some sort of automatic control that would make a projector change the image that would be projected on the wall and ceilings and everything. Uh, which were just points of light, you know, looking kind of like a, a star map or a, or it actually could have been some feature of this craft that had a way of allowing you to see through the surface of the craft to the surroundings. Now, so, this was a star pattern, you know, mm -hmm. and to me, this doesn't make sense because why would you need to see the stars to navigate amongst them, you know, it, it, it seems like it would be much more technological than that. It might just be that it was a coincidence that you could see stars, and the only purpose in that was for like uh, close quarters navigation, just getting into the hangar or uh, another craft or something. But for whatever reason, when when this, this these controls that I approached, uh, there was controls on the ch uh, a chair in the in the middle of the room. Um, when I manipulated those in an attempt to uh, open one of these doors, perhaps, it, most of them didn't seem to do anything at all. There was one that caused the star pattern to move, which was very disorienting. I was already, you know, having balance problems. But uh, to have all of these points of light shift in unison, you know, gave the initial impression that you were you know, leaning out the opposite direction. But uh, it's failing to get any doors to open. I was really hesitant about continuing, thinking, what if these, this, what if this is controlling where this craft is? I'm so stupid that, you know, I thought this might be something that was actually moving the craft. But so you were still, getting aware that you were on the craft. You were yeah, I knew I was on the craft. Once I saw these beings, I, you know, recalled the incident in the woods at that point and knew, you know, where I was and, and you know, felt captured. You know. Had you ever seen Star Trek before, 75? Oh, yeah. I'm sure, yeah. Okay, so you're Everyone kind of aware of that there could be intelligent beings that may not try to eat you. <laughs> yeah, but... I, that was not uppermost. That was not my impression. Like I said, I was being ruled by on a very instinctive level that something was very wrong inside, mortally wounded, and feeling trapped. And that feeling of suffocation, just removing the ability to think clearly and do anything other than just, you know, succumb to panic. Fight or flight, yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, really hesitated to you know, pursue the button pushing thing any further. It wasn't really uh, doing very much anyway. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this man came in through the door that I entered through. And, and what color was his hair, if he had hair? And uh, I, you know, people call these people Nordics. He, he wasn't platinum blonde. It was just sort of a sandy blonde. But uh, I just took him to be from some Earth-based agency and that this was some kind of a rescue. Mm -hmm. And uh, was he taller than you? Or? He was a little taller than me. You know, I was only 22. I was a very young man, and this was a, you know, would have been somebody more mature than me. And uh, he seemed to be unafraid, mm -hmm. and I was in a terrified state. So that was uh, reassuring to me. You know, somebody who looked human who didn't seem to feel that there was any threat, even though I started screaming all this stuff about these creatures in here, we better watch out for them and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Uh, he was unconcerned, but just was trying to lead me out of there. I was only too happy to go. If he knew how to get out, let's go. Okay, so he, he's leading you. And you. You have no telepathic communication. No, I didn't get anything from him. He didn't uh, seem to uh, want to respond to my uh, <clears throat> bell. But, uh, he, um, I thought, you know, wearing this helmet that maybe he couldn't hear me with that on, or or maybe he talked properly with with it on. Uh, so 
I went with him anticipating that, you know, maybe I'd learn more when he got me safely away from this captive situation I thought I was in. Um, he took me out of this craft. Now, I don't know how long it had been there, but at this point, the craft was actually inside of a, a larger enclosure, a, a building of some kind or part of a larger craft. Mm -hmm. And it was so much cooler outside of there and uh, so much easier to breathe that I felt quite a bit of relief coming out. But it was also so much brighter outside, it you know, hurt my eyes. I didn't realize just how dim it was inside there. And I think this had to do with probably that these creatures are used to a very low light level. Mm -hmm. And uh, that any, any creature that uh, we find on the Earth that has extremely large eyes is probably either nocturnal or uh, lives in the deep sea or in a cave somewhere. But uh, it was so much brighter outside it almost hurt my eyes. Uh, uh, and it was uh, seemed almost like sunlight even though it was coming from these big rectangular panels. Uh, the room was shaped uh, like a quarter of a cylinder on its side. So, you know, the wall behind us, as he led me across the open area, uh, curved up to form the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was directing me towards this vertical wall opposite. Uh, the craft we came out of. I tried to look around to see where, you know, where he might be taking me. And um, the, it was, um, there was other craft in there, other mm -hmm. disc-shaped uh, craft. So and, were they all the same or were they different? Well, they were sim similar to each other, but more rounded than the one I came out of. The one I came out of seemed more angular. So the one you came out of, do you have any idea of how big it might be, the size it of the It was car? the same configuration as the one in the woods, so I, I assume it was the same one, or, or possibly not, I don't know. Uh, it seemed bigger at that point, but uh, it also was not giving off any light, it was just metallic. Mm -hmm. It was not glowing, didn't seem to be hot or anything like that. But I was mainly concerned about where is he taking me, where is he taking me, because he seemed to be in, this, in a hurry, kind of half dragging me along. I right. felt very unsteady on my feet and very weak and really injured, messed up. Do you think he might have uh, been aware of your injuries and that you were not stable yet and needed to... Yeah, now I, I think that he, you know, he... It took me a lot of years to kind of figure out a scenario. It's just my, you know, I'm making some assumptions, but... If he figured that I was injured and he needed to get me somewhere to continue uh, uh, this re resuscitation thing, then that could explain his urgency. But I, I needed to really pay attention to where he was taking me just to, you know, not fall down. He was right. uh, moving us along pretty quick. So before we, we move to the next step, uh, do you recall how many craft were in this? There was at least two other ones than the one I came out of, but possibly a third one behind the one we came out of. That might have been some kind of reflection because even though that surface was putting off light, it was also very shiny. Like I'm, I'm looking at a big screen TV right now and there's an image on it, but at the same time I see a reflection of us in it. Right. So, you know, a source of light can both reflect and, you know, have an image. So. That's why I'm not certain whether there was two or three in there. Okay. But like I said, I wasn't studying out that situation. I was mainly concerned, where is this guy taking me? You know, and is this a rescue? And So let's go back to this, this guy. So he walks in front of you, or you walk behind him? Or he was kind of half leading because he was in, uh, in better condition than me. I was pretty messed up, so he was kind of half dragging me along. Uh, I was, so was willing he to go, you? but uh, yeah, he was taking me by the arm, okay. and uh, so he was kind of half dragging me along, but I realized I was too weak to kind of help myself, so, you know, it was kind of like he was helping me along, but 
moving faster than I felt able to. Uh, so was I was concerned with where he was taking me. He was pretty strong to be with him. Oh, yeah, he was strong. Okay. So you were concerned. So go to the next scene. What happened? Well, uh, there was uh, some double doors that opened when we approached that slid back, and we went down a hallway. Uh, uh, there was a room at the end of the hallway. He left me in that room. There was a chair there. Uh, he you know, kind of put me in the chair, but uh, uh, he just proceeded on out of there. But these other three people were dressed like him except for one thing. They weren't wearing helmets. So I'm, you know, the main thing that I was interested in was getting some answers. And so I started in with all the, the, the questions, if you want to call it that. I was pretty much screaming like a, uh, out of my mind in fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, trying to get them to tell me what were these creatures, where was I being taken, and what's going on here. And they, they weren't real hostile acting, but they were leading me over toward this table and trying to get me to lay down on this table. And I became extremely uncertain that this was any kind of rescue, that, you know, what is this? Uh, and I was afraid to cooperate. So I started resisting. I was extremely weak and not very effective at resisting, and they were stronger than me. Uh, they really didn't have that much trouble. Probably if I had been in, uh, in full possession of my normal strength, they could have won that wrestling match because they felt very strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there were, there were what, three? There was three of them. And there were, were they all male? Or? It was two men and a woman. And the woman uh, produced a mask. So kind of like a gas mask. I didn't see any hose connected to it. But when she got it over my face, you know, that just felt claustrophobic. Obviously, I'm going to fight that. And in my panic, I was able to get one arm free and get my finger under the edge of it. But I wasn't able to pull it away before I just became unconscious. It wasn't painful or anything like that. Uh, it didn't seem intoxicating or any way. It's just I just blacked out. Right. So, then, do you remember anything else inside this ship, or this? Uh, well, yeah, of course, you know, I remember details about how the surfaces look, you know, um, colors and, you know, texture. I mean, you're and talking about your stuff, sequence but... of action. So you pass out, do you wake up again there? No. The next thing I knew, I woke up on the highway. Now how much time obviously i found out later that so much time had elapsed i must have been either in a coma or unconscious a great deal of time although later the hypnosis uh indicated pretty strongly that there was other conscious memories that were being blocked for some reason um, and uh, they were unable to penetrate that but some kind of like dreams that came by years later uh -huh. um, involved these human-looking individuals. Not now the nightmares that hit me, you know, right after I was returned. That was just, you know, hell on earth for weeks. You know, uh -huh. they, that that image of those eyes boring me uh, was very troublesome. That was the main focus of my nightmare. But then later on, especially years later, after I started doing the interviews again, uh, these uh, little images of these human individuals kept coming back. Nothing that really had any narrative to it, nothing I could uh, you know, make any sense of. Right. But images of the humans that you interacted with came back. Yeah. Um, I just got out of the hospital. Human nurses and doctors check on you like every hour in the hour. Uh, was, was, do you think they may have been checking on your progress? I really do think it had to do with that because I was I was on my back. I was horizontal. And these images are mostly of them standing and me not. And at one point, there was an image of me being moved uh, through a room or a corridor or something. 
But like I said, nothing that really told the story. They were just little vague fragments of something. Uh -huh. Wow. So, so you were returned, and you found out it was like five days later. But when you woke up on the, in the middle of the road, right? Yeah. Were you feeling any physical pain? There was a little bit, a kind of an ache in my head, but nothing like I'd experienced before. And I felt, you know, a little bit weak, but much, you know, much more my normal self. And I saw the, the craft depart. Uh, a light caught my attention, but when I looked, it was no longer on. I just looked in that direction, but I could see this shiny metallic surface there above me before it just shot up into the sky. So at that point, what was your emotional state? Well, you know, it might seem strange that to find yourself on some paved road out in the middle of the woods in the middle of the night, that that would be reassuring. But my most recent memories were of the terror that I had been experiencing. So this, by contrast, was quite a relief. You know, I, I'm at home in the woods and, you know, I've worked there for years. and so. It, uh, it wasn't that, uh, you know, a threatening environment like it might be for some people. Plus, uh, I felt free, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer a captive and, and I can breathe and uh, freely. Uh -huh. But also, I looked down the hill and I could see the lights of the town down below. And I recognized it. You know, it's a familiar stretch of road I passed through many times in my life and so i just ran in the direction of the town so you were able to run at that point yeah did, did you um at any point did you think they took your clothing off uh no you know my clothing uh it was cold out I was, the pavement was cold i felt that and i could feel that cold air was coming into my clothes but it was like i hadn't been there too long mm -hmm. you know to feel the cold air, you know, coming under my, you know, sleeve and uh, pants, cuffs, and like that, and the surface I was lying on was very cold, but um, it, it it wasn't, you know, like freezing cold. But mm -hmm. It was just a, an impression that I had at that point. And when I first stood up, I felt a little bit weak and unsteady on my feet, but uh, I, you know, sort of got my legs under me as I ran. And, ran down into the town, it, it was just kind of a spurt of uh, hope there, uh -huh. uh, the feeling of freedom. I'm running away and nothing's dragging me back, so uh, I came to a building. The very first building I came to that had any uh, lights on and there was uh, steam or smoke coming out of the chimney. And so I started pounding on the door and screaming and uh, nobody came. And, you know, come to think of it, uh, there could have been somebody inside that thought, I'm not opening the door, there's a crazy man out there. You know? uh, but apparently they didn't call the police, uh, uh, or maybe there was nobody there and they just didn't hear it. There no, nobody there to hear. But I ran on down, this was across the first bridge, and I could see more li a cluster of lights farther down. And uh, I came to a, a, a service station there, and uh, there was a row of phone booths there. That's what I was looking for, as a way to call for help. So you still had money in your pocket? No, I didn't need any money. <laughs> uh, the pay phones in that part of the country, you just pick up the phone and take the receiver and put it to your ear and you get a dial phone. Oh, wow. So, you know, I called the operator. I made a collect call to my uh, uh, brother-in-law. Uh -huh. And because of the hysteria in my voice, the operator listened in on the call. Totally illegal, but um, a good thing actually in the end because you know the, the skeptics later were trying to concoct uh, other scenarios that had me in other places. But that was a way that you know, it was verified because he listened in on the phone call and uh, notified uh, the sheriff. And there had been a long-standing arrangement with the local phone company because back in the days when radio communication amongst the sheriff's department was pretty gifty, pretty patchy, 
that they would actually have a big light up up the hill, uh, on top of the hill to turn on, and that would notify them to go uh, call in. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it was kind of a strange system, that, uh, a little the cooperation with the phone company. But, you know, later on, uh, claims of, of uh, involving who called who and all that uh, are backed up by the fact that the, the sheriff knew the oh. Senate officer out there. Uh -huh. But uh, did they send an ambulance? Uh, no, actually, all they sent was a local officer, and uh, but he arrived too late. And probably, you know, due to the fact that it was just too hard to get somebody out of bed and get them uh, in their car and over there faster than uh, my family, uh, who you know were every night you know, burning the midnight oil, uh, right. you know, uh, over the. Uh, I said family. Maybe. How far away were they from where you were calling them? Uh, they were 30 miles away, so it, took, miles. Uh, it probably took them at least 25 minutes to get there. And that's, you know, breaking every speed limit. In that part of the country at that time, uh, there wouldn't have been anybody else on the road. But, um, and what time was it? Uh, come to find out, it was something like midnight or midnight. something. Uh, I, I don't have that time right off the top of my head. but. Uh, I wrote it down at the time. Right. So who was the first one to reach you of your family? That was my brother-in-law and my brother. And my brother-in-law answered the phone, and he thought this was another prank call. Uh, they, the family had been having people call up on the phone and make, you know, really stupid you know, kinds of comments. But some of the some of the comments they they thought were helpful. There was one lady who was a nurse uh, working in a hospital, and an old couple came in who had had an encounter with a craft, and they were in bad shape for some reason, uh, whether it was just trauma uh, or for whatever. And um, when she came back on shift the next night, the couple was gone, and uh, everybody was acting suspicious in their denial that there had ever been such a couple. You know, when she was asking, hey, where are they, you know? So she was saying, if, you know, he's ever found, uh, just be careful who gets a hold of him. And they all, uh, the, my family also had another call from a guy that said he was a uh, uh, retired CIA. And he had the same advice, watch out who gets a hold of him. So uh, the town had just been a madhouse, you know. There was a news crews from other countries there, and reporters being extremely aggressive, you know, taking pictures through the windows and tracking the family and, you know, yelling questions. Huge amount of pressure with all these uh, prank calls and just, you know, sort of cat call sort of stuff, just anybody involved walking down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it was such a crazy environment, and I was in such a fragile condition. My brother resolved not to turn me over to the sheriff. You know, I wouldn't survive that. So uh, he uh, took me to Phoenix right right away. His idea was to get me medical attention, and he figured that that was not going to be possible. So he drove you like that there. night? He drove me that night. To Phoenix? Yeah. So he went to a hospital? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, a there? deputy came by and said, what are you doing? He was out there pouring gas in his car. And he says, oh, just get ready to go home. And, and the officer left. Uh, I think, you know, it was related to the tip uh, that the sheriff had got about the phone call. But I think when they didn't find anybody at the phone booth, that they assumed that it was some kind of a prank call that had been listened in on. So he, you know, pretty much, you know, just took my brother at his word and, and, and left. Uh -huh. So um, my brother took me to Phoenix the first thing the next morning, he, you know, bright and early. He was uh, on the phone trying to make contact with some UFO researchers who had been uh, at the site during the search. You know, there'd been a massive manhunt in these five days that I was gone. Uh, and uh, these re uh, researchers had been there and saying, hey, if he ever shows up, you, you know, we're the ones to contact because we're, we're the only ones that can, uh, you know, handle that kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. we, we got doctors in our membership. So my brother got in touch with this guy and he sent us to an address 
uh, of this member that was supposedly a doctor. Well, when we arrived, we found out this was no doctor. It was obvious. It was just some little, um, basically a hotel room, and did not look a medical in the slightest. Uh, so it was like, a, like on the door it said Dr. Lester Stewart written in um, um, magic marker on a manila card, you know, and it, there was nothing, you know, very uh, reassuring about the, the whole situation. We, we knew we were in good at that point. So this, back at the Phoenix Hospital, um, what did they say? What did they find? What well, they with you? Um, later that day, um, <clears throat> my brother was called from um, the uh, director of the uh, Internet, of the uh, Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. They figured out where it was. See, my brother had, kept, had been getting calls from the media, you know, and he sent them off on wild goose chase. He wasn't going to turn me over to them. I was in no shape to talk to anybody. So he just uh, made up this story that uh, I was in a Tucson hospital. I, I think he felt obligated to let him know you can stop looking for him, but he didn't want to turn me over to anybody because I couldn't handle it. You know, I am so grateful to him. He yeah. saved my life because if he had been so protective and so fierce, and that took a lot of strength to push back on the pressure to turn me over, you know, both to the sheriff and the media, I wouldn't have survived that. I was in such bad shape. I was hanging by a thread. And, uh, you know, I'm so grateful to him. Um, uh, at great he, personal cost to him. Is he still alive? No, he's no longer with us. But, but, uh, so this, he was your guard and he protected you. And so you said you were in bad uh, shape emotionally, right? Yeah. Uh, so um, APRO was willing to send real doctors. They had some two, uh, two uh, real medical doctors in the Phoenix membership who made a house call. They brought over some you know, basic equipment and checked me over and made arrangements for a, a battery of medical tests uh, uh, beginning uh, uh, some that day and some the next day. So they didn't address your emotional state, though? Well, uh, you know, in his report, the doctor described my emotional state, but uh, by that, at that point, it was, it was, uh, you know, it, I wasn't in a state of, you know, screaming about it anymore. I was uh, more just um, looking. Well, they uh, they described me as looking like a caged bobcat. <laughs> That's one term. Uh, uh, the doctor's description was extremely flat, you know, basically a zombie. Uh, so, so how long were you in that kind of state, like a caged bobcat? You were oh, it, it, didn't, it didn't end. It went on for weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we did all these medical tests, um, you know, um, pretty extensive um, uh, EKG, uh, EEG, upper body x-rays, uh, blood and urine tests. Uh, it's pretty thorough. Check, uh, check Did they out. find anything? Uh, well, I think it was important that uh, the uh, blood and urine samples were put through the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's drug screen because the UFO group that thought they had the case had announced it to the media and were bragging, and they had to come up with some reason why we had broken off any association with them. Uh, looked into this so-called Dr. Stewart's uh, background, and he had no medical degree. He had told the, the, the news media he was a medical doctor, and uh, he had a diploma from a... Uh, uh, you know, mail order degree. Yeah. Okay. He only been in existence for two years, so he was no expert of any kind. And, but he told the media that he was a, a drug expert, and that the whole reason uh, that I had ceased to cooperate with him was because I, I was afraid he would see that I was hallucinating on drugs. Wow. Which, you know, as I said, the medical test disproved. Uh, 
but um, there was a, a lot of testing that was, you know, mainly done to, uh, as a reassurance. I was in a panic about was I going to, you know, have ongoing you know, consequences to this. You know? right. uh, Radiation poisoning, uh, some kind of bizarre infection, who knows. So you were in this, uh, this state. When did you come out of it? What were your first thoughts? Like, when you finally kind of integrated yourself? Um, I was just, uh, you know, walking around stunned for, for weeks and weeks, you know. I, it was difficult to sleep. I'd sleep and, and have nightmares. Uh, you your attention. I've just been handed an urgent news story, and I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Hey folks, Captain Nighthawk here. Do you have a favorite host? Well, imagine if you all have all the broadcast shows from 2013 to listen to anytime you want. Awesome deal, huh? Anyway, so stop by freedomslips.com and order the entire 2013 library of your favorite host for just $30. Not only do you help with the station funding to keep us on the air, you also help the host because they get half of the net on every order. Also, we have Revolution Radio's all-time favorite shows all on one disc. The details are really broad, so you'll have to visit the website and go look at the details yourself. It's, again, www.freedomslips.com forward slash season2013.htm. And get your favorites. First come, first serve, 7 to 21 days for delivery. Thank you. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information ever sleeps. Including me. <laughs> Later. We've got to stop them. They're going to kill us all. Who are you? I am the architect. I created the Matrix. I've been waiting for you. Why am I here? You are the eventuality of an anomaly which, despite my sincerest efforts, I have been unable to eliminate from what is otherwise a harmony of mathematical precision, which has led you inexorably here. You haven't answered my question. The Matrix is older than you know, as you are undoubtedly gathering the anomaly is systemic creating fluctuations in even the most simplistic equation. Choice. The problem is choice. Right here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Be here Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for Private Eye Matrix Revealed with Monique Lassonde. Enter into a world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven, Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio Freedom Slips.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. If you think for one second that the Capitol will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourselves. Because we know who they are and what they do. This 
is what they do, and we must fight back. You can torture us and bomb us. Fire is catching. And if we burn, you burn with us. Good evening. Are you awake yet? I hope. We've tried and we've tried for years and years to use passive resistance and loud voices to make a change. But time is over. Your governments around the world have no other goal than to decimate your entire existence at the hands of the bankers and the elites. The war is coming, and it's your choice to decide if you want to be a warrior or a victim. Denial is not a choice anymore. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Cleaning house. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. You didn't give me no fries, I got an empty box. Would you like another extra big ass fries? I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. I'm sorry you're having trouble. Come on. Trouble. I'm, I'm sorry you're having starving. trouble. Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we believe in freedom of ideas, freedom of speech, but above all, we believe in freedom of existence through self-reliance. This station is 100% listener-supported, and as a fundraising promotion, I have a kick-ass free gift for a $100 donation. 35,000 seeds. 25 years in the freezer. Long-term storable, 54 different varieties. So, if food prices go crazy... The shit hits the fan, or if you just want to save tons of money every year by creating your own food like I do, grab our seed pack special. Just look for the banner on the homepage at freedomslips.com. Don't be a statistic. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. We need to ask humans to start taking care of ourselves and not depending on the megacorps to provide unhealthy, nasty food. Included in this package is also a DVD with 900 survival and off-grid living documents and the offline home canning how to do everything website all on the DVD. So when you're growing all that food, you know how to can it, store it, preserve it, etc. with all these documents. So thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you will pick up this package and start learning to be free. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. What do we do in life? It goes in eternity. your host of the Samsung Report. Join me for Wild Bill's Headline Roundup every Saturday night right here on Revolution Radio.
The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Aloha and welcome back to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. And I'm your host, Janet Care Lesson. And in this second hour, we're going to pass the baton over to Dr. Sasha Lesson. We're going to continue our interview with Travis Walton. And we're going to bring in Jennifer Stein, the creator producer of the uh, movie Travis. But before we pass all this around, the reason we're passing is because we're in a lovely, beautiful home in San Pedro after this incredible conference. Sky West. West. Okay. Fire sky. Skyfire. Skyfire West. Sky I, I knew I was going to Christmas on that one. Summit West. <laughs> and we just got done. We have. We're just having a great time here, but we're we're kind of like not at home and we're on the road, so uh, we are limited with our headsets here. But okay, so uh, please go over to the donation button on freedomslips.com. And donate whatever you can, a dollar, five, fifteen, twenty, whatever you can donate is greatly appreciated. And we do rely on your donations to bring you these incredible programs like this one. Uh, Tom, Thomas Becker, are there any specials this week? Uh, no, ma'am. We're just urging people to get the archives. Five dollars a month, about ninety hosts, quite a bit of listening there. Yes, there is. Okay, so I'm um, going to pass this on to Doctor. Sasha Lesson. Well, we're just tracking uh, Travis's narrative. Uh, uh, he's disoriented. Uh, he is, his brother is sheltering him uh, from uh, people who uh, are trying to get hold of him. And uh, so just go on with your story and relate it to us. Well, you know, once I was returned from then on, it was a, it, it became just a media storm of, you know, people desperate to explain this away any way they could, beginning with the drug hallucination theory and then hard on the heels was that was the uh, uh, psychosis theory. So I underwent an, a, a battery of psychiatric Tests uh, all totally normal pattern and scores. Um, one day after another, you know, the medical test uh, you know, uh, um, refuted any claims of drug hallucination. There was a claim that the, the memory of these events had come somehow been inquired in my mind by the hypnotist, which is an absurd claim since uh, these things were repeated before the, the, the Dr. Harder had ever uh, had any contact whatsoever with, with uh, me or the rest of the crew who shared my report, you know, in the details of the initial experience. So certainly Dr. Harder couldn't have planted memories in their mind, uh, but it was just, you know, a whole litany of things that were just so easily reputed. Um, the initial attacks came from one particular debunker who uh, put out the uh, explanation uh, that it was the planet Jupiter. And this at a time when he believed that the event had happened to three men riding in a car. And he was so skifty on the details that he didn't even know anything about it to where it's, uh, you know, seven men riding in a, uh, in a crew truck in the woods, you know, it hadn't even, wasn't even part of his conception. And certainly an object, uh, you know, diameter uh, less than 100 feet away is cannot be the planet Jupiter. There was no mistaking what we were looking at. This was so uh, obviously an extraterrestrial craft was not uh, an Air Force helicopter. Was not a planet, uh, or any of the other certain explanations like you know, the plasma. Uh, it was a clearly defined mechanical object covering there. How did all this nonsense affect you? 
Well, it was extremely frustrating to uh, you know have people trying to explain it away in ways, especially things that were uncomplimentary to me. You know, I, I'm not crazy. I'm not lying, and um, you know to the point where uh, you know being um, examined by a number of psychiatrists who, uh, although in their view, uh, my report was sincere. Since they didn't believe in UFOs, they uh, invented the uh, uh, transitory psychosis theory, uh, which, of course, is just absurd in the face of uh, uh, seven people seeing the same thing. It's just, there's just no way a psychological explanation can account for the uh, reports of seven men seeing the same thing. But there was a variety of uh, uh, efforts to explain it away. Initially, uh, the men uh, who uh, witnessed this incident were accused of murdering me and making up the most bizarre cover story for my disappearance. Uh, no, no sensible person should be considering that as a viable option. If, if the theory that uh, there had been a fight at work and uh, I had been killed in a, some sort of a fight, chainsaw uh, attack or, or whatnot. Uh, the most obvious explanation was, well, he went over the hill here in the woods and used the restroom and never came back. And, you know, we could speculate that a bear or mountain lion dragged me off. And, and uh, it much, much easier to be accepted than, than something as wild as uh, he was <laughs> taken away by aliens. So, you know, the whole idea that this was a murder to begin with was absurd, but it did uh, serve one purpose. You know, the, the accusation was uh, investigated using the state police lie detector expert who came and tested the men and found that they were telling the truth. Now, back then, you know, everybody acknowledged that uh, polygraph is in 100% that there is a small percentage of error at, at times, but the president of the American Polygraph Association commented on this case and said that when you have six people passing tests on the same issue, the odds of there being any mistake would rise into the, the um, odds of a million to one. And that was with six people. Um, now that been like 16 past tests in connection with this incident, I underwent five different lie detector tests, um, all by uh, three experts who um, had the, the, the best of credentials in terms of polygraph, all of them with years of law enforcement experience. The last one's being state-of-the-art equipment by a firm that did work, work for the uh, uh, place the factory in the New Mexico State Business and even the United States Marshal Service. So, um, and uh, many of these tests, uh, uh, the conditions and, the, and all that were reviewed by the top academics in polygraphy. You know, Dr. David Raskin and uh, Baxter, uh, who had done some of the fundamental groundwork of research scientifically in the field of polygraph. So, uh, Dr. Harder made the, the observation back then that had you had um, this report be uh, uh, six or seven men uh, saying that they had witnessed a murder, that, even without lie detector tests, would have been sufficient to convict a person of murder in the uh, American Court of Law. But so, uh, when it's a, a UFO, even with lie detectors, suddenly people continue to question what's going on. So, in some, in some ways, you know, it might have been better had there been no lie detector in terms of a court case. You know, if you have seven witnesses to say this happened, that's a court case. Anyway, that wasn't sufficient for that. 
And uh, the efforts to explain it away with various theories and people uh, concocting various theories have uh, continued, including a broad attempt by the, the chief skeptic uh, who had been, you know, the debunker had been attacking the space in parts of several books and dozens of papers that he sent out to the media. What was his name? Uh, Philip Class, uh, uh, a professional um, debunker who, it turns out, with uh, uh, information from the, uh, from a Freedom of Information uh, um, request from the FBI, his file uh, showed that he had been under investigation by the FBI uh, uh, for um, disclosing confidential information, classified information. And uh, he uh, was, the prosecution of these offenses was withheld. And the case was turned over to the Central Intelligence Agency. We have a copy of a memo from J. Edgar Hoover himself to the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. These are, uh, you know, documents from them, uh, with the uh, with a, a, a redacted section that ends with uh, picks up again with the phrase "and not to be of service to his government." A clear indication that uh, once this matter was turned over to the Central intelligence agency, this man became a pawn, um, you know, a useful idiot, as they call them, of the Central Intelligence Agency in the disinformation campaign against the uh, belief in the public, by the public, uh, in the existence of UFOs. So, um, uh, the manifestation of this came in the form of a $10,000 bribe offer to one of the crewmen. Um, trying to pay him to claim that the whole incident was a, a hoax. And uh, it was basically an admission from this class, um, the class of debunker, that this offer had been made. It would have been impossible to deny since the, uh, the offer was carried as a message to uh, uh, one of the crewmen by a local deputy, Jim Click. It was impossible to uh, deny it, and when uh, Mike Rogers, the crew boss, was outraged uh, the, by the idea that one of the crewmen would actually consider taking a bribe, said, well, if you would do that, even though you know it really happened and would do it just for the money, then you're going to be bruised. And so Philip Class, the offer, the bribe offer maker, uh, said, uh, reported this, but used three little dots, which is called, it's called an ellipsis, to eliminate the middle part of the sentence, basically saying, if you would take the money, then you'll be bruised. Eliminating the part that said, even though you know what really happened and would do it just for the money, was basically a very deceitful attempt to make it look like Mike was threatening his crew member uh, to keep him from uh, revealing the truth rather than to keep him from lying to accept a bribe. So it, it's clearly a bribe and uh, absolutely undeniable uh, that it was not accepted, even though uh, subsequent attempts to, you know, get him to take this $10,000 um, were pursued even after he changed his name and moved to another state. Well, this is clearly illegal behavior. Was he in any way prosecuted for it? Uh, no, no one ever uh, filed any charges against him, but it was uh, clearly unethical yeah. and uh, clearly uh, a, a tacit admission that it requires this kind of uh, tactic to suppress belief in this incident. If there was any, you know, acceptable evidence against it, then that's been what it should have gone for. I'm not trying to pay somebody off. And you know it's it's you know practically um, a perverse endorsement by this debunker for him to resort to this kind of uh, tactic. But you know there's a lot of information in his FBI file uh, where the FBI refers to him as uh, not being in complete possession of his faculties and uh, 
uh, not to have a, a much of a sterling and, and clearly um, irrational in his uh, uh, arguments, uh, you know, that they had investigated him thoroughly, looking into the possible purchase of uh, radio transmitting equipment and, you know, the whole thing with the release. There was a lot of uh, redacted information, in other words, stuff that's still secret in these files, but enough of it to clearly indicate that they thought very little of him and had turned his case over to the Central Intelligence Agency. Which, you know, it's a standard uh, CIA recruitment tactic to have some prosecutable offense that they can hold over somebody's head to gain their cooperation. And, you know, the bank roll them. You know, the $10,000 obviously it wasn't coming from this class, it was coming from some other sort. So, you know, it was an unending on slot, digging into, uh, try to find anything negative against me, uh, you know, calling uh, all the bars in town. And when uh, Mr. Class was told, he never comes in. Uh, just, well, I'm not going to report that. Just looking for anything negative. Reports about the character of mine for Kenny or you know some of the other crew, and just you know only selecting things that they thought would damage the case and uh, uh, really dishonest, but some a, a, a really peculiar aspect to it. Why was there never an attempt to minister class to call me? He had a habit of calling up people. He called the polygraph examiner. He called the doctor who examined me, and he would tape everything they said, and then and then cherry pick and, and take out of context things to make it look like they had said something that they hadn't said. You know, calling Mike Rogers. You know, contacting Steve Pierce. You know, badgering all these people. The town marshal, uh, Deputy Flake. Uh, you know, all these people. The sheriff being contacted by him, and then here I. The person who this happened to, not a, a single attempt to call me, not a single letter from him. Very strange. I'm not trying to hint or suggest or imply anything because to me it makes no sense. I would be the most likely victim, the most likely target, you know, call me up, record some statements, twist them around, make it seem like I said something I didn't but not any contact at all? That's really strange. You know, when we appeared on the um, Larry King show in reference to this, he was kept in another part of the studio, never addressed me directly. I never addressed him directly, never laid eyes on each other. Closest we ever came, and he basically unloaded with a string of profanity on, on the crew boss who was on the uh, Larry King's show with me. And... Uh, I'm really baffled by the hands-off approach to me in regard to this. At the same time, years-long dedication to trying to do, drag my name through the mud. This really happened. There's a ton of uh, physical evidence of the site. You know, during the search, uh, there were um, light uh, not light detector. <laughs> um, uh, what do they call them? Geiger counter. Oh. Geiger counter readings taken of high radiation levels. Uh, it was uh, found that, that background radiation at the site after the incident was uh, about one and a half on this uh, device that was being used. They found that uh, a reading of three was uh, uh, taken from a radium dial watch from somebody that was present. But when the men produced the hard hats that they had been wearing during the incident, there was a reading of six. Six, which is double that of a radium dial watch. And uh, very peculiar and uh, uh, very uncooperative by the person uh, operating that Geiger counter. There was a number of um, magnetic readings. The entire clearing was gridded out and measurements taken and they uh, recorded on some Gauss meters, I don't remember the name, but my make and model number was uh, was uh, announced, and uh, with an actual polarity reversal in the direction that the craft had departed, there were uh, outage of the um, cable reception in the in the local community, 
uh, and sightings that were reported to the sheriff, independent of any connection to the crew, uh, of sightings of this craft at the time of the incident. There, you know, it's a recreational area. There's a lake nearby, and campers, hunters. It was deer hunting season at the time. And there were a lot of outdoorsmen in the area, and they reported seeing the craft pass over the top of them. So a lot of supporting evidence, and it was found that there were changes in the trees uh, surrounding the clearing where the craft came down. And, and, and this wasn't even discovered until 15 years after the incident. But a tree that, uh, that was six inches in diameter at the time of the incident had growth rings indicating that it was 85 years old at the time of the incident. And then in the, the intervening 15 years, the tree had doubled in diameter. So it went from being, you know, like uh, six inches in diameter to 12 inches in diameter. Uh, but this, you know, because the outer rings of a circle uh, encompass so much more area than a smaller circle, it was calculated that the tree was producing wood fiber 36 times the rate that it had. Now, that, at that time, was based on the assumption that this core sample that was taken from this tree represented the entire circumference of the tree. But some follow-up research here just a couple of years ago that was spearheaded by Ben Hansen of um, uh, the uh, television show Fact or Fake. He was doing follow-up research in connection with a documentary film um, that was being made uh, called Travis. <laughs> no, I didn't name it, but uh, it's a, a really important new film that's being made, uh, Travis, the true story of Travis Walton. Uh, extensive commentary from everybody involved, the polygraph examiner, the sheriff, the, uh, the deputy involved, the um, all the crewmen. Uh, and uh, this... Um, diameter of the tree, uh, uh, it was disco discovered that all the trees surrounding the area where the craft had come down had exhibited this uh, incredible jump in the thickness of the growth rings. Uh, trees normally produce one ring for each year, and that, you know, doesn't change no matter what, whether they're growing rapidly or slowly or whatever. You get one growth ring. And it's very easy to track this. There's a whole science mm -hmm. called the uh, tree ring science. And, and Arizona has one of the premier tree ring labs in the world. But um, the, it was discovered that the trees uh, around the clearing had this thick and growth, but with a, uh, a, a forest fire that had killed a lot, it was uh, no longer harmful to get a complete cross section of these trees. And these cross sections <clears throat> demonstrated that the growth of uh, uh, rings were thickened on the side of the tree in the direction of the craft. The back side of the tree was uh, more normal, uh, still thickened, but uh, not nearly as thickened as they were on the side of the tree towards the craft, whether it was north, east, south, or west, uh, where the craft came down. The thickened rings pointed to the side of that craft. Well, Ben Hansen, who had, uh, you know, supervised this expedition back there to do this follow-up research, did some online research to just, uh, you know, investigate the effects of radiation on pine trees and discovered that the pine uh, species in the vicinity of the Chernobyl nuclear accident, uh, although it wasn't directional there, you know, the radiation settled around these trees and came from all sides, that they had produced wood fiber at three times the rate that they had prior to the accident. So um, um, this um, effect is contrary, it's counterintuitive. You know, you would think that radiation would kill plants, but uh, in the case of radiation, for some reason, it accelerates the growth of at least pine trees. And this is, uh, you know, conclusive evidence that something very powerful occurred in that clearing there on that mountain. And um, there's a lot of follow-up research going on. You know, I, the EEG, the brainwave scan that I underwent, uh, reveals 
an unusual pattern. And this is extremely significant because the technician involved was never informed of who I was. Because of the intense uh, uh, frenzy, the media excitement going about this, the doctor had me go to uh, get this test performed and uh, put me in there under an assumed name. So this is sort of a double blind thing. He had no preconceived ideas of, or expectations about what these, this test would reveal. And yet this unusual pattern was cited in the report. Now we're going to do some follow-up research um, uh, with this um, brainwave scan and see how this compares to an individual who might have been electrocuted or um, uh, hit by lightning or something of that nature. So uh, other kinds of brain trauma, what, what, what would cause this sort of thing? And uh, again, a more recent brain scan uh, analyzed for did this unusual pattern persist or was it just sort of a, uh, something that was tapering off right after I was returned? Uh, a lot of interesting stuff, follow up with the uh, uh, samples of these tree, uh, this tree growth, you know, uh, soil samples, um, you know, ongoing testing with, for the magnetic readings. Um, here after 41 years, uh, you know, there's a lot of study and an unending re uh, revival of these old allegations, the, some of the uh, current crop of uh, UFO debunker skeptics type. Uh, insist on repeating uh, stuff that was uh, uh, discredited long ago, disproven. You know, that these theories to try to explain it away have no basis in fact, no basis uh, in anything. And uh, I've written a book, uh, Fire in the Sky, that takes each one of these um, um, allegations head on, uh, Gives it a fair examination and points people in the direction where they can uh, verify for themselves that there's absolutely no basis for this. Uh, the debunker offered the theory that this was some bizarre story to get the uh, crew uh, boss out of his logging contract. And uh, there's uh, signed affidavits from the contracting officers themselves that. Um, that there is absolutely no way such a story could benefit uh, the contract uh, uh, termination in any way, and in fact would harm it. And uh, as a matter of fact, it was never even discussed at the um, uh, uh, hearing uh, to uh, default the contract. It, it was defaulted because you know uh, the crew wasn't about to go back there, and and. Uh, and it was finished uh, by another crew in roughly the same number of time and man days that were uh, allowed left on the contract. So all of the theories designed to discredit this have been, uh, you know, thoroughly examined and disproven. There's such a huge preponderance of evidence that you were uh, telling the truth and the other guys were telling the truth. Didn't any uh, professionals uh, stand up for this, this guy's telling the truth and this is what happened? Well, you know, uh, the um, uh, state police polygraph examiner says, I will stake my reputation on the integrity of these tests, but these men are telling the truth as they see it. And uh, uh, there's a, quite a number of people who have uh, looked at uh, this case, reviewed it, you know, UFO investigators, uh, and uh, analyzed every allegation, and there's not a single thing that, you know, has ever come forward after 41 years to support anything to try to uh, uh, undercut or, or discredit uh, what happened. You know, people ask me, well, why are you still out here talking about this, you know? And it's, you know, it's something I ask myself, but, uh, you know, I, I feel uh, a responsibility to try to set the record straight and uh, allow people to understand that um, this phenomena is real. And, you know, just set, you know, the, the conditions of this case aside. You know, never mind all that. Just from a logical standpoint, you know, we live in a universe, we live in a galaxy uh, with a, maybe a hundred billion stars. And 
the contention, the implied contention by uh, people who don't want to believe it, that that's completely devoid of life, uh, is is so absurd on the face of it that you know it, it's more their position that's that's uh, cuckoo <laughs> than uh, mm -hmm. the people who have seen this thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, you know, I had a number of uh, you know documentaries that were done over the years. You know, several dozen actually uh, that you know. I participated in in order to set the record straight, and there's a lot of them out there and that are available online and whatnot. But here a few years ago, um, I uh, met up with a filmmaker named uh, Jennifer Stein, and uh, I'm going to have her talk to you a bit now about uh, you know her um, mission to uh, record the facts in regard to this case. Well, let me just find out when your book came out. Well, the uh, book uh, came out originally in 1977, but then, you know, uh, after the movie came out, there was a, uh, a 1996 edition, and then, a, and then a newer edition in 2010. Uh, you know, twice the size of the original edition, and maybe someday there'll be a, a final edition to update with, you know, all this information about the, uh, the, the tree rope. Uh, the discovery of, of it was uh, was recorded in that edition, but there's you know all this new stuff about the directional aspect of the tree grove, and you know a lot of follow up research in medical and otherwise that oh and the attempts by um, covert agencies to undercut the truth of this matter. Great. Well, I'm going to pass my mic to Jennifer Hello. Stein. No, you, you continue. Uh, yeah. I can use drops as well. Oh, okay. We're used to working together. We, we can work closely <laughs> together. So I want to congratulate Travis because we just concluded the 41st anniversary of uh, his amazing experience that he's been brave enough to speak about. And the other six guys in the crew, while they were all living, were also brave enough. And the four remaining living crew members and, and fifth, including Travis, have continued to stick to their story after 41 years. And uh, they deserve a recognition and acknowledgement. Uh, they certainly get mine. I have a huge amount of admiration. And it was a great honor to work as closely as I did with Travis over three years to create uh, the film, Travis, the true story of Travis Walton. So we've just concluded here in California the Skyfire Summit West uh, conference that took place at uh, Ron James Studio called On the Pacific or On Pacific, something, Space yes. on Pacific, Space on the Pacific, which is a wonderful studio in San Pedro, California. And we shot a new program for MUFON TV, which is really wonderful, and the Evolve TV network with a new number of speakers. Um, and that's a way to acknowledge that this story is important and significant and needs to continue to be told. As tiring as it may be for Travis, it is important. Um, and I will add that the, the film, Travis, the true story of Travis Walton, is continuing to screen in film festivals. And we recently won a number of official selections and best documentary film festivals, only even as recently as September and October of 2016. Are so, you selling these uh, uh, this film? Yes, we are selling a DVD, which was the original version that we first put out. It's called Travis, the True Story of Travis Walton, and that's available at TravisWaltonTheMovie.com. It's also available on Travis's website, which is... TravisWalton.com, simple as that. So anyone interested in getting this uh, new documentary, which is one... Uh, technically over 26 film festival awards, uh, 17 official nominations and an additional six or seven uh, best documentaries, uh, best film, you know, various additional acknowledgments uh, after it screens. There's an award ceremony at each film festival, so it's won five or six additional awards on top of being selected. So uh, we're very, very honored by that. It tells us that mainstream film festivals are interested in the story. And in that way, we have disclosure happening. It may be disclosure with a little D, 
but it is gradually getting out there. People are interested in this story. They want to know the facts. Uh, this film is a way to get the facts uh, quickly and in great detail. And uh, the film that's available to the retail uh, community is rapidly becoming a collector's item. So we've had to, to duplicate you know, uh, DVD copies uh, very, very, very quickly. Um, it's, uh, so we're very pleased with that. So this is uh, a very important, I think, uh, because it corrects the uh, the monster aspect that the that the Hollywood film uh, added uh, to make it uh, exciting for uh, kids to scream at. Yeah, it was uh, you know they they take a horror story approach to it. Uh, you know, it was very horrifying for me, very traumatic. And you know, if we get a remake of the movie, and I've been approached by a number of producers. I'm sure it's it's going to happen, but when we do it, it's it's going to be truer to what really happened. Uh, yes, it was traumatic. Yes, I was you know extremely horrified, but you know I, I want to you know include uh, a better understanding of my current interpretation of what happened. That I was actually uh, <clears throat> it was less of an uh, uh, of an abduction than it was an ambulance call. That my accidentally getting injured made it necessary to bring me aboard and uh, try to repair the damage. And uh, that's a lot different than what I perceived to be at the time. Are you smarter than you were before? Did they? Uh, did your brain grow like the tree brains? Well, <laughs> that is something I don't really like to discuss. But yeah, I actually did have a, a, a uh, IQ test before and one afterwards. And it was quite a bit of difference. But, uh, you know... People argue about IQ tests all the time, so. They upgraded you. Uh -huh. That's the theory. I'll uh -huh. add that um, even though uh, maybe Tracy Torme was directed by his uh, uppers at Paramount, that it had to create this fictionalization of what happened on board the craft with Travis, which is really where the story dramatically diverted from the truth. Um, Tracy really didn't want to do that, but he really didn't have any control. He really initially wanted to follow the outline of Travis's book, but um, his hands were tied. He was, a, you know, a, just the director at the time, uh, and he didn't really have, a, you know, a, there's an, this old... Well, just the screenwriter, but, you know, basically the only people with that kind of control are the studios, the people in charge of the money or the funding. So when I made the film, I was committed to sticking to the truth. And I think uh, once I convinced Travis of that and I gained his trust, we made a decent attempt to create a documentary, which is completely different than a fictionalized film. Uh, but we attempted to stick as true to the story and bring in as many experts as we could that would, were willing to you know, share their professional opinion of uh, Travis's honesty, the crew's honesty, uh, the people involved and the legitimacy and, and the importance of the story for humanity's future. This is really important because what this does is it establishes with multiple witnesses and scientific evidence that there is an extraterrestrial uh, consciousness that has a technology that far exceeds that which we're allowed to know about our, our own. And it, this, can, this is disclosure, and this is the best case we have, I think. Well, over time, evidence will accumulate, and it's sort of a trickle-up sort of a effect, the grassroots uh, beginnings of an awareness that uh, is gradual and, and actually needs to be, you know, uh, for the uh, most orderly transformation of society. It, it needs to be at a pace that people can handle. And what is the significance of disclosure? What do you think it means for us? Well, you know, we're going to have to become aware of, you know, uh, technologies that are vastly older than our own. And um, I don't know what the uh, quote-unquote rules would be in terms of, you know, having that kind of technology infused into uh, the air-based society. To have that done abruptly, of course, would be extremely destructive. You know, uh, the worldwide economy is uh, petroleum-based and and to have that end overnight uh, could really create a lot of havoc. But, uh, and certainly the people who are profiting from it would be the most opposed to it. But everyone has to realize it, it, it in some way would hurt everybody. So the, uh, 
a tactic of the aliens themselves to never <clears throat> be totally out there in a way that says, you know, here we are, is probably in our best interest. And, you know, I have to say grudgingly that even the government's position that this isn't real might be uh, in everyone's best interest for now, anyway. Jennifer, what would you like to say about that? About disclosure? Yeah. I think uh, you can look at disclosure as having already happened. We had a fabulous presentation this weekend by Steve Bassett, and I would encourage anyone uh, to go to Evolve TV or MUFON TV and look at his presentation. He pretty much lays out systematically that if you're really willing to look at the articles that have been published, you would think actually disclosure already happened. Um, certainly in Travis Walton's case, that was a pretty good example of disclosure. But there has been always an undercurrent uh, within our society to want to ridicule uh, this truth. And depending on what uh, discipline you're in, whether it's medicine or whether it's you know, law or whether it's certain aspects of science or certain aspects of space, you will find a consistent uh, element that wants to limit the truth that's there. Uh, maybe for the protection of uh, you know our existing institutions and our you know uh, religious traditions, to kind of maintain our status quo that we've had for the last 200 to 2,000 years. But whether we like it or not, uh, technologically we've advanced to the point where we're now traveling to uh, Mars, where NASA's announced they're going to launch a mission to Mars. So if we can possibly have arrived at this level of technology, why is it so impossible to believe that some other culture at some other point in history hasn't done it before us? I mean, we're very egocentric about when uh, civilization began at any point, in any place, in any time in the universe. What we need to do is start getting smart about the way that we approach this. We need to have you know, uh, UFO studies going on in major universities. We need to begin to start empowering uh, our populace to decide how that contact is going to happen. We need major universities to do in-depth studies about how this will affect our future and how we want to control this if we can. The only university that's been brave enough to even scratch the surface was uh, Penn State University, which launched a five-year study, and they produced a fabulous paper. Did, but did anyone hear about it? No. It was a very cross-cultural, interdisciplinary uh, approach from uh, psychology and government and sociology and politics and science and energy. What would happen to our society if we engaged in contact? And they referred and related their data to other indigenous cultures that then made contact with the advanced world, and their cultures completely fell apart and changed. So there was an initiative to try to uh, set a strategy of approach in the future that we should consider taking. And we should get governments and pol you know, policymakers and educational institutions to get on board and set strategy for how we would like to engage with other intelligent species. But no one's taking this seriously. And we need you know, government agencies, private institutions, educational and university, uh, academic institutions to begin to address this topic. And I challenge them to do it. It's not easy, but we need to do it. Uh, you know, I, I'm an anthropologist, and so we relate to a people called the a Dogon, who say they've mm -hmm. been instructed by extraterrestrials. And like when they have a dispute, they put the people in the dispute in a room, together in a hut, and they don't. No one goes out until they reach a consensus. They also uh, understand quantum physics and uh, how uh, thoughts manifest uh, waves into particles. And so I just. I uh, think that the, the ET presence uh, is beneficent. I live in Arizona between the Apache and Navajo reservations, and uh, the Native Americans have a tradition going back uh, centuries, uh, an awareness of the sky people. Uh, you know, it goes back uh, before recorded uh, history in the sense that the petroglyphs in, in the canyon walls uh, throughout Arizona, depict uh, alien craft and uh, be alien beings. So, 
this is something that's uh, uh, not been introduced by Europeans. It's, it's something they've been aware of for a very long time. I'd also like to suggest to the listening audience, they might want to look up Laird Scranton's work on the Dogon. He had, does an excellent uh, you know, description of their knowledge uh, and their understandings uh, that really defy explanation because it was over thousands of years ago that they had this knowledge. Yeah. Okay, what, what else would you like people to know about what you're going to be doing with this, uh, with, with your story? Well, you know, we hope to take uh, Travis, uh, the true story of Travis Walton, and, uh, and uh, get the interest of uh, a major broadcast entity, uh, because this is an important uh, um, information that uh, people need to know about, and uh, I, I think that's uh, definitely on the horizon. I would uh, counsel people who are interested in this subject, before you make up your mind about any, anything, uh, please get the facts first. Look at every aspect of it and, uh, you, know, you know, don't bias yourself in favor of any outcome. You just want to, if you want the truth, you know, that's got to be uppermost in your mind. You just want the truth no matter what it is. Beautiful. Beautiful. What would you like to tell everybody, Jennifer? Oh, gosh. Um, I would like to tell them that there's uh, ways in which they can educate themselves. And new uh, technologies are arriving uh, where they can choose what they want to watch. They don't need to sit down and entertain themselves with movies from you know major Hollywood production companies. They can Google and watch Netflix and go on to Evolve TV and MUFON TV and start to uh, you know see these incredible interviews that are out there and uh, start to read books and go to conferences and every listener here has a role to play in disclosure they shouldn't shy from it i myself didn't think that i had a role to play until uh you know opportunities presented themselves and i said you know what if i'm willing to put you know my money on the table and my hard work at, at hand push up my sleeves and you know, make a commitment, take a vacation that I would have otherwise spent somewhere else and, you know, work on a documentary film, I could begin to influence people and, you know, through media, begin to share new information that wasn't out there. So, Well, I would say certain select media, like the one you're listening to right now, because I think, you know, I come up with a slogan, fight bias, impeach mm -hmm. the media. Oh, and how do we impeach the media? I'm talking about the media that, uh, that you know, suppresses truth, the media that presents biased reporting. And the only way to suppress those is to boycott their, their, um, mm -hmm. their sponsors. And uh, we have the power at, at the root of it. But if we do not get an accurate, honest media, we're lost. Yeah, you know, that's in anthropology, we, we call it nullity. Stop, uh, you stop participating in an institution and it no longer exists. And the boycott is certainly uh, one form of that. Um, I'm, I'm thinking also of, you know, the uh, pipeline and the people uh, that, like Wells Fargo that finance the pipeline. And so if you withdraw your money from these institutions that are uh, backing uh, the pipeline, You'll be supporting Native Americans and protecting our land and their land from pollution by oil. There needs to be as much outrage at the way they're being treated as any of these uh, sort of uh, race relation uh, uh, stories that we get. Um, we've we've got to uh, we've got to take back the truth, and and uh, the only way for them to know uh, is to is to let them know. Let them know that. Uh, uh, the, the, let the sponsors know that uh, if they don't demand impartiality and honesty from the media, that they're losing customers. <laughs> Hit them where it counts for them. It worked with the uh, great uh, workers when uh, Cesar Chavez uh, had us boycott grapes, mm -hmm. and then the workers got a, a, a much more decent uh, uh, wage for their labor than they had before the boycott. Yeah, in passion, please, you know, you can go on and complain forever. You're, you're not getting anywhere until it's something they care about. And, you know, financially, that's their chief motivation. That's what 
you know, it's the engine that drives the media. So uh, I think they'll be happy to be <laughs> more uh, impartial and honest if we just make them. Yeah. And I would like to say, you know, uh, you know, Hillary hasn't said anything, Trump hasn't said anything, but Jill Stein has stood by the Native Americans and said, I'm with them. Stop this terrible abuse of the land and of the of Native Americans. And I just want to uh, talk about that and mention that, too. And you, you see, you're going to have to go to the Internet. You're going to have to find alternative media like the one you're listening to now in order to even learn about this. This story is practically being ignored by mainstream media. And like I said, when they, there's something they want you to uh, see, it's all over. Uh, and this is one they, they don't want you to see. I'd like to add that the Native American communities were here long before you know, uh, Western culture arrived. And we may see a time in the future when we need to turn to the, those Native American traditions to um, rejoin living in balance with the land and moving on to the reservations en masse for uh, freedoms that we no longer have in the civilized world. Um, so uh, the Native American communities may very well be uh, saviors of humanity in one way or another. And it's, it's uh, a possible future that many people have not even considered, but I've had the intuition that uh, that very well may be a reality that we may have to face. So uh, we need to begin to support what I call closed loop systems, sustainable systems that uh, balance the impact that, that they have on the environment. And no longer can large corporations trade their polluting rights because they never had polluting rights to begin with. So why can one company that isn't involved in any kind of pollution, like possibly banking, you know, turn around and sell their polluting rights to a company that's way over polluting? You know? So corporations being given um, almost human identities, according to the way our corptocracy works in, in Washington is a, is a huge political problem. So we have many, many problems to solve, but it takes intelligent people in the roles that they play to, uh, to really step up to the bat and do the right thing. Manchin Laughlin. We're on our way to Lachlan, Nevada for a Starworks convention. <clears throat> uh, it's a wonderful conference, uh, reinvigorated by Paula Harris and uh, Bob Brown, who had the original UFO Congresses in Lachlan for over 19 years. It's a wonderful new conference, and Travis and I will be there screening the new film. And uh, many other speakers will be there. And I think we'll also have you guys there as well, right, Janet? Yeah, we're coming. We're not, we're not uh, speaking, but we're going to have a booth. And uh, I highly recommend you come to it. It's uh, Starworks USA, and the film is going to be shown again, right? Correct. And Paula Harris has done an incredible job putting this conference together. Ron James will be the MC. We'll All right. Well, thank you. That's the end of our show. You've been listening to The Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio. 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 Yeah. Oh. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. Who owns you? If you're not in control, then someone else is. Join me, Ivy West, for Voices on the Wind, Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern in Studio A. I discuss government, health, metaphysics, Suppressed science, universal mysteries, little-known incredible facts, alternative energies, and even more than you can imagine. Won't you join us on Revolution Radio Saturdays from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern for Voices on the Wind with me, Ivy West. Fire. 
because if your head's in the sand, your tail is a target. <laughs>